Welcome to the uh, Alaska Independent Democratic Coalition's press availability. I'm Representative Chris Tuck, and joined with me today is Representative Les Guerra from Anchorage, serving on the uh, Finance Committee, and then uh, representing uh, Southeast in the Sitka area, Representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins. Uh, visiting this week, we have Alaska Youth for Environmental Action. We have Alaska Travel Industry Association here, and also Facing Foster Care of Alaska has joined us. Uh, coming up later on today, we just heard some hearings this morning um, with um, Adjutant General uh, Laurel Hummel, Lori Hummel, and uh, we'll hear her again in uh, Department Mil I mean, sorry, Military Veterans Affairs Committee uh, later on today at 1. And then uh, the House Education Committee is scheduled to get a briefing on the Ketchikan School lawsuit by the Attorney General's Office later on today as well. Uh, so we have uh, the budget, operating budgets being worked on, House Bill 72. Uh, we are going to hopefully have amendments, a CS out today, be able to hear amendments. Uh, we're halfway through session right now, and uh, we hope that we can get some bills moving, really. We have um, committees being canceled, and it's time to keep the committee action going and start hearing some legislation. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Representative Christ Johnson to speak. Thank you. I'm, I'm here mostly to, to highlight two, two points of interest. Um, the first is that in the coming week, the governor is going to be making nominations to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. And I'm basically here to say that this is a really, really important thing. This is the Alaska legislature of, of fish management. It's sort of the, the Super Bowl of fisheries decisions. And the, the three nominations for both seats the governor is going to make are highly, hugely important to coastal Alaska. The North Pacific Fishery Management Council, it's an unwieldy name for an entity, but the decisions they make have multi-billion dollar uh, impacts, especially to Alaska, and there's a, a constant tug and pull, tug of war between uh, Alaska and Washington and Oregon based interests, and the decisions make there, made on the council have direct economic ramifications on our state. And the other point I'd like to, to mention is that um, together with a few other legislators, we're looking at introducing a, a bill on immersion language education and uh, there were charter school advocates recently in the Capitol and in Juneau, and we had the opportunity to sit down with a lot of them. And uh, the, the immersion language model of education has been highly successful, uh, especially at the charter school level. You look at uh, Fronteras up in the Matsu and Rilke Schule, which is a German language immersion school in Anchorage, and both have long waiting lists, and the academic outcomes there are really compelling. And we're looking at introducing policy that would um, make sure that the unique needs of an immersion language school are, are met in policy. And uh, so we've got a, a bill underway and we're hoping to introduce that soon. Yeah, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, I, uh, I like to brag about him because uh, you know we took 40 years to get the native languages bill that he passed last year. I mean, people wanted to see that for 40 years and his freshman year he was able to get that. And I think it's just logical to go to the next step in trying to get the immersion um, um, charter schools going. And as he says, those are successful. And why not? I mean, we have it for German. We have it for Spanish. We have it for others. We should ha actually have it for native languages as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Lesquera. Thank you. Uh, today in the Finance Committee, we're going to uh, vote on amendments and uh, present a budget uh, for a vote on the House floor. There are a number of flaws in the budget the way I see it right now. Uh, Representative uh, Gaddis has cut every single state funded pre-K program in the state to zero. No parents as teachers, no classroom pre-kindergarten that's state funded, uh, no best beginnings. None of the things that give children a chance to maximize their academic potential. And if you don't teach a child one year, you can't just come back a couple years later and say, now I'll do it. You've lost that opportunity. The budget right now includes a cut to education funding that will result in teacher cuts across the state. We're going to try and restore funding so that we don't see another year of teacher cuts. Teacher cuts and staff cuts have a few impacts, not just on schools, but on the economy. When you keep growing class sizes, you deprive children of academic opportunity. We know that. And for most of the last five years, we've lost teachers, career counselors, the people who educate our children. But if the public sees no commitment to education, and they have a five or six or seven year old in school, 
they've got to wonder whether or not they're going to take their engineering skills or their small business or their skills as a doctor or a physical therapist or a nurse to another state. That's the other problem with underfunding education. When the public sees no commitment, sees you eradicating every single pre-K program the state pays for in the state, you lose parents and you lose workers and you lose job skills and that harms the economy. So we're going to try and fix some of those things in the Finance Committee. The goal of working on this budget is to come up with a soft landing as the governor has proposed, but it's not to balance the budget on the backs of children, on the backs of kids with FAS. It's not to balance the budget on the backs of seniors. It's not to balance the budget on the backs of people who can't handle the load. It's to balance the budget or to find ways to save money by cutting waste and by targeting folks who can handle the cuts. So that's going to be the focus of our amendments uh, in, um, in the Finance Committee today. You know, they also cut, um, uh, Representative Wilson cut two very major job creating enterprises we have in the state. We have an oil and gas training center that teaches people the skills they need if they're going to work on the gas line or frankly in the oil field. She's cut that program, a job training program. We have a construction academy so that people can get good high paying jobs. She's cut that program. We're going to try and restore those things. The goal is not to get rid of jobs in the state. The goal is to produce a vibrant economy and not balance the budget on the backs of kids. And then finally, uh, maybe the most important uh, issue we're going to discuss in finance today is Medicaid expansion. Uh, Medicaid expansion will save the state $6.6 .6 million in state money. When we have a budget deficit, finding a budget cut that doesn't hurt people is an amazing thing. We should take advantage of it. It will produce 4,000 jobs when economist Neil Freed says we're on the cusp of losing 2,000 jobs next year in this economy. We need to protect against a recession. It will bring in $145 million of federal funds. That's not state money. It'll bring in $145 million of federal funds that will ripple through this economy. If you want to do something that moves this economy forward, that gets people health insurance, that gets people medical care, that reduces the budget, that's what you do. And so uh, that's going to be a big discussion in the Finance Committee today. Thank you. So we want to concentrate on a budget that uh, protects public education that uh, provides for affordable and accessible health care, uh, making sure that we have safer communities and providing opportunities for Alaskans. So one that um, gets the best bang for the buck that Alaskans benefit from and doing the least harm. We'll open it up to questions. Katie Moritz, Juno Empire. Um, yesterday at the Senate Majority Presser, senators were saying that they hadn't had this is about Medicaid expansion. They hadn't had um, regular everyday people coming to them and saying that they were hoping for expansion. Have you guys had the same experience? Have people been coming to you? Just wanted to hear about that. Uh, I have no idea what part of the state they live in. Um, in Anchorage, during the Anchorage public meeting where people came out to testify, uh, over two dozen people testified in favor of accepting Medicaid expansion. I don't know that a single person testified the other way. In this building, we've had the hospital associations come in and say, uh, Medicaid expansion will allow us to probably reduce the cost of coverage for everybody else so they don't have to pay for the cost of uncompensated emergency room care. Um, in the Finance Committee, we had three days of public testimony among the most popular topics in public testimony was that people wanted us to accept Medicaid expansion and not turn away the 4,000 jobs that come with it. So for folks to say they haven't heard anything, I guess they weren't at Anchorage Caucus where uh, we had over 100 people, 150 people, and they weren't listening to the budget testimony uh, where that was probably uh, one of the top three most important topics for people as they testified. Uh, that and the emails, so I, I just don't know what part of the state folks are in if they're not hearing people talk about Medicaid expansion. I question whether or not he gets any emails at all. I mean, I, when I get emails, that's, that's it, education, Medicaid expansion. Uh, good morning, Matt Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. I'm curious, can you guys talk about um, your guys' uh, 
I don't know if it's like a super minority, but the ability to control the access to the constitutional budget reserve, if I'm not using statutory budget reserve, constitutional budget reserve, um, and how that plays into what happens with the but with the budget on the House side and your guys' uh, negotiations? Well, to reach into the Constitutional Budget Reserve does take three-quarters vote, and so the majority alone um, can't make that happen. So um, so they will need us um, in the final days of deciding what's in the budget and what's not in the budget. Yes. Alexander Gutierrez, APRN. Um, if there isn't some sort of, I guess, negotiation that can be reached or willingness from the minority to do this, um, I, I guess, would you all be willing to let the budget fail? And do you have any concerns about, you know, I guess, perception of obstructionism because of it? Yeah, there are things that are still shaping right now in the legislature, Medicaid expansion being one of those. Um, we're still in the early stages. We don't even have this on the floor of the House yet. Um, so the operating budget goes over to the Senate, and then the Senate makes some changes. So really, it, it's um, we're watching to see what takes place. We do have our priorities, and uh, I laid those out earlier. You know, we want to make sure that we have a lasting commitment to public education, making sure that uh, we have safer communities, and making sure that uh, people have accessible and affordable health care. So we'll be looking at all of those things when uh, seeing how it shapes out in the end. I guess the question is, would you be willing to let the CBR vote fail if you don't get those things that you want? It all depends on what's there and what isn't there. I mean, really. Um, our commitment is to Alaskans, and uh, we have a, um, a public mandate for people to work together. So I'm hoping that as everything shapes up, we'll be able to work together and we'll be able to come up with agreement on the end on uh, what's best for Alaska. Uh, Pat Forge, Alaska Dispatch News. Uh, so what do you think of this? Uh, uh, sounds like a quid pro quo. You give us Medicaid expansion, we'll give you reform. Is that the offer they're trying to? I'm not a big person on trading votes. Uh, so here's what we know. Medicaid expansion saves the state money, cuts our budget deficit, brings in 4,000 jobs, brings in $145 million of federal funds that will ripple through the economy that don't cost Alaska anything. At Alaska Regional Hospital, they will build a medical clinic so that folks don't have to go to the emergency room and get uncompensated care if we get Medicaid expansion. The positives are 100% on Medicaid expansion. Um, this, I don't hear anybody saying they want to leverage my vote for another bill. Uh, and we'll take a look at other bills for sure. Valerie Davidson, the Commissioner of Health and Human Services, proposed $20 million worth of Medicaid reforms. Um, I still haven't heard an, an explanation why the Commissioner's proposal uh, isn't good enough. But uh, we'll listen to proposals for sure, but it's not going to change our vote on Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion brings jobs, cuts the budget deficit, and will strengthen the economy at a time when Neil Freed says we're about to lose 2,000 jobs just next year. It will be good to get the 4,000 jobs to balance that out. And Valerie Davidson's uh, uh, analysis is sitting there on the table, the $6 million of savings, the, the federal funds we'd get in. Any further questions? Anybody on OffNet? Oh, I'm sorry. Katie Moritz again with the Juno Empire. I was just wondering, um, Rep. Guerra and Rep. Christ Tompkins, if you could talk about the cuts to the ferries um, and if you expect that to kind of be reversed at least a little bit and also what your take is on it. Jonathan, take that first. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll defer to the, the Finance Committee deliberations to those members on finance. Um, the ferry system is obviously integral infrastructure to coastal Alaska and southeast Alaska. Um, obviously, all aspects of state government need to take a hit because of the fiscal climate. There are no sacred cows, employ whatever cliched metaphor you like about the budget process. It's, it's my hope, and my colleague in the Senate has expressed this as well, that, that coastal and rural Alaska doesn't take a disproportionate hit 
when it comes to cutting services and budget costs. Um, I have some concerns about the current level of cuts to the marine highway system. Um, I mean, at, at the same time, I'm encouraged at looking at the system and trying to find efficiencies, savings, et cetera. But um, I, I certainly hope that upon further deliberation, the Finance Committee will maybe moderate or mitigate the current proposed cuts. Yeah, um, I think uh, Representative Ortiz, uh, Representative Christ Tompkins, uh, they wrote a pretty compelling letter to the Finance Committee, um, since they're not sitting on the Finance Committee, on the importance of the Marine Highway. Uh, so massive cuts that destroy the Marine Highway are not an option to us. We all understand that folks need to economize. I believe that, uh, that there will be progress on the Marine Highway in an affordable, responsible way in the Finance Committee or on the floor. Um, uh, but you also, uh, you also have to make sure you don't throw away money that you need to protect what you have. And um, uh, you know, tomorrow uh, you'll see right across on the floor a bill that should save us about $15 million. Right now the oil companies use the haul road to transport uh, their equipment to the North Slope. That's fine. But at a time over the next two years that we're going to get negative $500 million in production taxes, <coughs> in oil tax revenue from our production tax. That is, we'll be paying the oil companies under our production tax and credits. At that time, we should be getting something back and not subsidizing their use for things like the haul road. So uh, you'll see a bill read across tomorrow that'll try and say you need to pay your fair share. Just the oil industry, not tourists, not visitors, not hunters, uh, not truckers, but yeah. Uh, and, and things like that will help us protect the infrastructure we have on roads, marine highway, airports. And the Alaska Marine Highway, you know, we don't make a profit on that, but we don't make a profit plowing roads or grading the haul road e either, but it's a necessary piece of infrastructure for the veins and vessels of our economy to keep flowing. Yes. Alexander Chiras, APRN. Um, do any of you all have a position on the speaker's bill that's going to be heard tomorrow that would give a tax credit for ammonia processing facilities? Yes, sir. You know, this is an extension of a bill that was passed last year. Uh, last year, the state, I think, wasted $150 million uh, by giving $10 million to three refineries. The testimony was one of the companies was losing $1 million a year. One of the companies didn't want the money. And one of the companies there was no evidence from. But a refinery bill was passed last year to give $10 million a year to those companies, whether they pay taxes or not, for the next five years. That's $150 million. There was an attempt last year to include the agri plant into that bill. That failed. We'll listen to the evidence on the agri plant. Their problem has always been, is there an available supply of natural gas? It looks like there's an available supply of natural gas in Cook Inlet right now. So I'm going to have to be convinced that at a time of a $3.5 billion budget deficit, uh, the state needs to engage in more corporate subsidies. Uh, um, you know, more corporate subsidies, subsidies when you have a budget gap are not always the answer. We'll listen to the evidence, but we're already losing $150 million over the next five years uh, in a bill that should have been rewritten as Representative Osterman and I said in a bipartisan manner, which is, if your company's having trouble, we'll work on low interest loans with you. That's what most companies that are in trouble get. They don't get cash from a state that has a $3.5 billion deficit. Loan interest loans seem like the smarter way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that's pretty much said it all. Uh, you know, these are investments that we're making. We like to see a return on there. And even if it's a, a loan at 0%, we're still better off than just giving it away. Anything else? All right, you guys are easy today. Well, thank you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Oh, okay. Go, feel free. Um, uh, so the governor has now been scheduling biweekly meetings with the majority leadership. Are, is anything similar happening with the minority now? Well, um, we've met with the majority as a full caucus uh, earlier um, in session, and then I have a meeting with them tomorrow morning. But is there going to be something scheduled in place, like with the majority leadership? Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to have some regular meetings, especially with uh, talks about the Medicaid expansion, um, talks about the final looks of the operating budget, and then how um, the gas line proposals will shape out. So we're hoping that we will be able to have uh, 
um, more communications with them and uh, be able to um, share back and forth. Uh, yes. I guess I'm going to squeak in a question here about daylight savings. Uh, I guess the vote uh, comes to the floor tomorrow. Uh, what do you think, if it passes, what do you think the chances are of that bill passing the House? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we're a non-binding caucus, the Independent Democratic Coalition, and so we, we vote independently. Um, depends on if you're southeast, uh, western Alaska, uh, Fairbanks, Anchorage, on, uh, on how you support that or don't support that. So I don't even know in our caucus right now where we stand on that. We'll listen to the debates, watch and see what happens in, in the Senate. And uh, uh, it did pass, I believe, in 2010. I believe it passed out of the House but never made it through the Senate. But the House has changed quite a bit since then. Um, so, yeah, who knows? There's other important topics, though, that we need to be talking about. One of them is the gas pipeline. Um, you know, some of the things that really impact uh, families and communities. Uh, not that to say that daylight savings won't, but, uh, um, you know, we actually have uh, some important legislation that I think needs to go through the committee process, and we need to have the opportunity to hear those, and I just think it's unfortunate that we've been canceling some committee meetings when there's other work to be done as well. And you want to talk about gas pipeline at all? You know, just, uh, just on the gas pipeline, and this is very disappointing. Uh, we're negotiating with the most sophisticated corporations in the world right now, Exxon, BP, ConocoPhillips. We should be presenting a united front. Um, the governor had a reasonable plan, which was we'll take a look at two projects that will produce this, a, a large amount of revenue from the state and cost affordable gas. Two large pipelines. Sure, we're happy to go with Conoco, Exxon, and BP, but if they push us into a bad deal, we want them to know we have another place to go. There's a competing project out there. I th I'm, was disappointed to see that um, another bill was filed to gut the governor's plan. That sends the message to Exxon, Conoco, and BP that we're not united. It weakens our negotiating position because Conoco, Exxon, and BP now know that they can play legislators against the governor and some legislators against other legislators. When you go into a negotiation, if you're negotiating for a car and your wife is on the cusp of a good deal and then you stand up and you say, I'll take it, what you've just done is ruined your negotiating position. Um, I think the governor had a smart, uh, smart position to say, we want two large gas line proposals out there. The other problem with the, the new proposal that came out of the legislature is it replaces a large pipeline that gets us revenue, which we need to get out of this budget deficit over the long term with a small pipeline that produces very little revenue and very expensive gas. So to trade out affordable gas for more expensive gas and a pipeline that produces almost no revenue uh, for one the governor proposed that would produce large amounts of revenue, A, I think was a bad idea, but B, I think undercuts our negotiating position with Exxon, Conoco, and BP severely. Oh. Sure. But Rep. Perry, you voted for SB 138, um, and we're hearing the majority say they see the governor's bill as actually doing, as making it look like he's not united with the legislature. I mean, it seems kind of a chicken or egg problem in terms of, of branches of government. I just wondering if, if you yeah. could kind of square that. Sure. Uh, the um, the in-state uh, bill that you're talking about, I voted against the first version of it. The second version I voted for under the promise that it would be transformed into a large pipeline. That's different than this new bill that was, that's been filed. This new bill says uh, the pipeline has to be so small that it cannot export any more gas than we use in state. So here are the numbers. We want a four BCF pipeline. That will produce a significant amount of revenue. Uh, this pipeline we use about less than a quarter BCF in state. And so it doesn't allow you to then sell more than that as export gas. So it'll be less than a half a BCF. That's, that's less than one-eighth the size of the large gas line. It'll produce less than one-sixteenth of the revenue. And being small, the cost efficiencies of running a small gas line will mean it's going to produce much more expensive gas. That's not what was promised in, SB1, in, in the prior version of the gas line bill when the testimony was, no, this could be a big gas line. Um, it's now guaranteed to be a small gas line, uh, one-sixteenth basically the size 
um, uh, or one eighth the size of, uh, of of the one Governor Walker is proposing, with one sixteenth of the export revenue for the state. That's not the way to get out of a fiscal problem. I'm sorry, SB 138, Governor Parnell's bill last year? Yeah. I, I voted for that um, as an option because that was a large gas line. You need a large gas line to get revenue for the state. Uh, you need a large gas line to get affordable gas for people inside the state. The smaller the gas line, the more expensive the gas and the less revenue you get. So I did vote for 138. I said I had problems with it. I hoped they would get fixed. And what the governor says is we'll either do that, and if that doesn't work out, we'll work with buyers who want our natural gas into an alternative large gas pipeline. So the governor had two large gas pipelines on the table and I have no problem with that. Um, you have to let, when you're in, in negotiations, you have to let people know you're willing to walk away from the table uh, to a better deal. And I think the large companies know that uh, uh, you know, if they negotiate seriously, that's probably the proposal we'll go ahead with. But I think the pressure the governor put on them was good. Katie Moore, it's Juno Empire. Do you think, you said that a non-unified front sends the wrong message to those companies. Do you think that changing the plan this far in also sends a bad message to those companies? You know, I'm not in charge of negotiating the gas pipeline. Uh, no single legislator is the governor is in charge of negotiating the gas pipeline deal. He saw the best chance to get a good deal on our gas and fair revenue for our gas and fair terms for our gas as to say we have two competing projects and when you have competition you get a better result when you tell the three lar three of the largest companies in the world you're beholden to them and not going to negotiate with anybody else they know that you're stuck with their deal and they have much more leverage over you so i think what the governor tried to do is smart i think it still leaves the bill that passed last year, the, 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 the large gas pipeline that we voted on last year as, as, the primary, uh, as the primary goal, but lets them know there's competition. Any further questions? All right, well, thank you for being here, and we look forward to seeing everyone next week.